in the Gospel of John this morning. And just uh, my prayers that God would speak to us uh, uh, from this passage. Just wonder if you've ever encountered uh, a fishing expedition where you caught nothing. Um, Peter, in this passage, is, is going fishing. Um, and we're just going to read the first 14 verses of John 21. And... Um, draw some points from this account of the, the inability to catch fish uh, at first and then look at uh, how Jesus uh, really intervened in that situation. What can we learn from that? John chapter 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you, ha you do not have any meat or fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his own garment, garment on, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came into the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out of the land, so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, "Bring some of the fish which you have now caught." Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Father God, this morning we just thank you for your word and we just pray that you would open us, our hearts to it, and that you would teach us uh, some practical lessons this morning for our own lives. And we give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The account opens up here with uh, uh, the manifestation of Jesus, but he had come already. And uh, a couple of times before that, manifested himself to the disciples after the resurrection. Uh, you know the story, Thomas. He said, unless I see, unless I touch, unless I feel, I will not believe. The manifestation after his resurrection is absolutely essential. And you think about this for the disciples who would be commissioned to go and preach Christ. They needed to have a firm understanding of the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just like the disciples of old, we need to understand the importance of the resurrection. Jesus manifested himself to these disciples. They needed to know they were no longer going to be following a man, but they were going to be moving on by faith. The, the, the disciples were told to wait until you are endowed with the Spirit from on high. Can you, can you for a moment think about sending Peter out without the Holy Spirit? 
That's a that's a disaster. That's a train wreck. Because of his boisterous personality and the way he often behaved, and yet God used him greatly when he would be under the direction of the Holy Spirit and changed into, more into the image of Christ. So what we have in this 21st chapter is um, verse 1. Uh, actually, I'm going to just give the main characters in, in this passage is Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, sons of Zebedee, and, and two others. Um, there are eight miracles out of the 35 that um, were recorded. John only recorded eight of them. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, this is the third time Jesus manifested himself to the disciples. And it also, uh, further on in the chapter, is the restoration of Peter to the Lord. But as we think about this, this passage, um, in verse 1, uh, I, I just can't help but think uh, the graciousness, graciousness of our Lord to come to these people uh, these disciples here this, at this time and would manifest himself to them. He wanted to, to bring before them the reality of the resurrection of himself. And I was thinking, you know, how has Jesus manifested himself to you? Think about it. Each one of us you know, when I think about how Jesus had manifested himself to me, not just in the gospel, but throughout my life. How many times have we said, that was Jesus, that was God that did that? You know, he wants to manifest himself to us, not just in the gospel, but in our time here on earth, when you think about the struggles that we might have encountered and how you look back and you say, you know what? That was Jesus manifesting himself to me. It didn't go the way I wanted, but he had an ultimate purpose that was different than what I desired. That's Jesus. I can tell you in my 60 plus years, Many times I've experienced where Jesus manifested himself to me in ways that was not human, it was divine. Prayer journal is so important for that reason because you can look back and you say, you know what? That was Jesus encountering my life and he changed me. He wants to manifest himself to us in our very life situations. When it gets hard, when life just is hard, and, and you get the doctor's report and you don't like what it is, or you get a, a, a report that you, you, you don't like and, and you become fearful, that's when Jesus comes and he manifests himself to us. How has he manifested himself to you? Has he? First and foremost, he wants to be your savior. He wants to manifest to you the fact that he wants to be your savior and he has a plan for your life. I love that he manifested himself to the disciples in this way. You know, it's interesting, Simon Peter, um, being a fisherman, um, you've got to wonder if he thought, you know, the person we followed is gone. Um, what do I do now? Um, what I thought was is not. So what does he do? He goes back to what he knows. He goes back to fishing. I'm going fishing. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going fishing. And I can just see Peter. He took, obviously, his fishing clothes because uh, he was ready for work. And he thought that would probably be his work. Uh, God had something different for him. And he was about to know what he was going to be fishing for in the future. But Peter says, I'm going fishing. Um, the rest of them tagged along. Uh, I don't know if he was impressed with taking the others, especially if they weren't fishermen. Sometimes fishermen like to go with fishermen. And, 
But uh, anyway, he had company. But we know that that Peter was was a fisherman, and uh, he was he was going to go go fishing. Uh, the rest of them said, "We'll we'll come also." Um, and that night they caught nothing. Interesting thing uh, that comes up here because this is not the first time the disciples haven't caught fish. Um, and it's by divine providence that Jesus said, you know, these guys are going out fishing, and he was well aware of where they were, and they need to catch nothing. Sometimes in our lives, our nets are barren. Even as Christians, our nets are barren. We're, we're just, there, there's no fish, there's no fruit. It, it just seems like, we're fishing, we've toiled all night, we caught nothing. No doubt the, the disciples, that's where they were. Peter was saying, you know, I'm a fisherman. This is my, was my living. And um, they caught nothing. You know, in Luke 5.5, 5, uh, this was another passage where the disciples went fishing, they caught nothing. Uh, <laughs> And so it, it wasn't the first time that this was an experience, uh, certainly for Peter. Um, it's interesting, though, that this would be the last time Peter would go fishing. There's never a recording after this where Peter went fishing again, because Jesus gave him his commission, and which would be very different. But the, in verse 4, um, the day was now breaking. Jesus stood on the beach, and yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Probably thought it was just somebody who was walking along the beach. Uh, they kind of struggled recognizing who he was. Um, maybe it was. Maybe it was dark. Maybe it just they were so concentrating on the fishing that uh, they they didn't recognize who he was. But when you get to verse five, Jesus said to them. And this is the question. Uh, it's kind of a question and a comment, really. He really was asking them, children, you do not have any meat, do you? Um, interesting. We talked about uh, last Sunday, uh, Dan talked about uh, who Jesus is, the deity of Jesus. And he did not lay hold of, of that deity, the power that he had for his own good. Can you imagine if you would put that in the hands of humanity? Hey, these guys are going fishing. <laughs> They're going to have a trip. They're not going to get any fish. Yeah, you can even make a storm come up. Can you imagine humanity having that kind of power? This fishing expedition was for their good. The no fish in the net was for their good. Jesus, by providential dealings, specifically gave the empty net syndrome to these disciples because they had to have another vision of who he is. It's kind of a question when you ask somebody if they've been fishing all night, you know, especially if you're a fisherman, it's, hey, got any fish? You look at their bucket or their stringer and there's nothing on it. Hey, you catch anything? You know, it's kind of a, at least for me when I've gone fishing, it's kind of a, either, either they're reminding me that I didn't catch anything. But in the case of Peter, uh, and Jesus said, you know, you didn't, you didn't catch anything. And they, he said, no. Just a point here that, you know, we need to be honest with Jesus when we come before him. If we have struggles, he already knows. He already knows. We need to be honest before him. I just love the way they said, nope. Well, you know, uh, it just wasn't the right weather. It wasn't this. You know, it, it, you know the guys that I took with me, they, they were noisy. They, they were just there for a good time. Jesus said, did you catch any fish? He said, no. Look at verse 6. He 
He said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. Now, if you were a fisherman, and you were in a boat, I don't know, six foot wide, and one somebody says, well, we're not catching them here. Why don't you try over here? And you fished all night, and you haven't caught anything. What would be your response? It's like, why? Why? This is one time that um, I see growth in Peter, that he didn't say, Lord, we fished all night. We didn't catch anything. There's nothing there. He didn't say that. So they cast them on the, left, the right side of the boat, and they were not able to haul because of the great number of fish. What is the point there? What had changed in this fishing trip? Not the boat, not the people, not the lake. The word of the Lord. It's the word of the Lord. Do we bow to the word of God that way. I ask myself the question, when I see something in the word and my life doesn't line up with it, what do I do with that? You know, I'm only robbing myself from a full net of fish, as it were, when I refuse to bow to the word of God. You see, I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you what I've experienced in my own life. It only works when we listen to the word of God and apply it. Peter, why he didn't do what he normally did, I'm very thankful. I see growth in Peter. I, I see a man who is so rambunctious, so choleric, and, and so going to get it done, and often speaks without, without thinking. And this time... Jesus said, why don't you cast on the right-hand side? And you know, as a church, as an individual, often what we do is we all go fishing before we ask Jesus, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? We often have programs before we have prayer meetings, and that's why we have fishless nets. And I just love the fact that there was obedience, complete obedience. Even though to the fishermen it might have not made sense, they cast their nets, as he said. There was such a number of fish that they weren't able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. You know, this this filling of the net was not for Jesus' benefit. And we'll see that a little later. He, he didn't need these fish. This, this was a moment in which he was going to teach the disciples a very, very important principle. And he uses it to teach us this morning. Obedience to his word is the path of blessing. And... Uh, Jesus had perfect knowledge of what was necessary. Just used an ordinary fishing trip to teach, to manifest himself in this way. Look at verse 7 this morning. Therefore that, Jesus whom Je that, for that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now they recognized it's the Lord. Not just somebody standing on the beach. It is the Lord. Why? Because the revelation of who Jesus is was face to face with them in a full net of fish. How has Jesus revealed himself to you and I in our lives? It's not a net of fish. There's so many ways that Jesus reveals himself to us in our life. And now he recognizes it's, it's the Lord. 
often we, we say the same thing. It, you know, that's that healing, that is a God thing. There's no way uh, I could tell you story after story of, of things that I've heard of people who've uh, gone through deep circumstances and recognized that it was the Lord. The things I feared in life, only to find out that they never did come to pass. You know, how often it would, how, how much peace we would have if we would recognize Jesus Christ in our life. Not, not, on a, not on the pages necessarily of Scripture, but in our life. He wants to be in fellowship with us in our life. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his honor garments, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. He had to get uh, dressed as he was going to face the Lord. Threw himself into the sea. Um, and then in verse 8, you have the other disciples came into the little boat. No doubt they had a bigger boat. As they got closer to the land, they, they had a smaller boat that they went uh, uh, to the land in. Uh, about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. Can you can you just see Peter? He, obviously, he was to the shore first. Um, he jumped in and swam to the to the shore, uh, and the rest of them uh, were left pulling the fish uh, to shore. Uh, a a a revelation of who Jesus is. Verse nine. So when they got out on the land. They saw a charcoal fire already laid and fresh pl fish placed on it and bread. You know, when I think about this, these men toiled all night, didn't catch anything, probably hungry, maybe discouraged, uh, maybe really confused. Um, Jesus was crucified and he did, uh, he revealed himself a couple of times. Maybe confused over what that all meant. Maybe confused about their future. They followed him. Um, you know, a lot of things come into mind here. And the Lord Jesus knew exactly where they were, both physically and spiritually. These men are hungry and they're probably tired. So, what does he do? He has fish and bread. Is that not who our Savior is? He knows when we are just tired out, when we are wiped out. He knows exactly what we need. And those men came ashore that morning. And who did they have breakfast with was Jesus. And I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where I've experienced maybe not breakfast with Jesus, but a time where I sat down and experienced Jesus in the Word. And it was just like having breakfast with him. And it changes who we are. You know, this was not the first fire that Peter sat around. Think about what this must have meant for Peter. The last time he was by a fire, you remember what happened? He denied Jesus. He said, I don't, I don't know him. He cussed and swore. He was warming himself by the fire. That was the last fire. This one was very different. But you've got to believe that he remembered that first fire. He says in verse 10, you know, one other thing in verse 9 is Jesus is not dependent on our efforts. He did not take the fish they caught and made them breakfast. He already had them. Where did he get them from? We talked about who Jesus was last week. Fish and bread. Where did he get that from? How did he start a fire? The resurrected Savior provided breakfast for his own. And um, when you look at this, he says in verse 10, Bring some of the fish which you now caught. And Simon got involved in verse 11, And they drew the, land, the net of land full of large fish. And he said, Instead of cooking them, counting them. 
Why was that important? 153 fish. You know, th th that little detail, you'd say, why is that important? Because it magnifies who Jesus is. He was manifesting himself to the disciples. Not just one or two. 153. And they must have been large fish because the issue was the nets weren't broken. They brought them to shore. There's something that's humiliating and humbling when you understand that Jesus is at work in your life. When Jesus ministers to you in a very powerful way, an answered prayer, with, without, when you realize that there is no other option but an answer to prayer, how humbling that is. And you see these disciples, can you imagine these guys that were fishing going through these fish? Counting them all, 153. You know, the secret to success is always obedience to his word. This whole story is, is about obedience to his word. And recognizing that it's not in ourselves. When we think about Ministry. I think about this. They, Peter was getting ready, equipped for ministry. And Jesus is literally telling him, Peter, you can't do it on your own. You cannot do this on your own. This is a spiritual battle. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot save people. But I'm going to give you the message and you're going to preach it boldly. But he had to get Peter to a place of humility and say, you know what, I can't do this. Peter's, Peter's makeup was necessary, but it had to be refined for the ministry. I know men who are in ministry today that are effective, but before they were saved, they were very, very rough. But God greatly uses them because he refined them. And it, they took that same personality, put it under the direction of the Holy Spirit, and God greatly uses them. Peter was one of those people who, he was a diamond in the rough, if you will. And he had to be sanded and, and worked over and remade so that he could be who God could use him to be later on. When I think of his message in the book of Acts, powerful message. And it's not the Peter that we first met. It's the Peter that was refined and, and manifestation after manifestation of who Jesus is. And eventually, you have the Apostle Peter who could preach boldly and is not afraid of anything. You know, when I think of Verse 10 and verse 11, the net was not broken. You know, I think God will always provide and he will meet the needs, our needs. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think of that, the, the net was protected from being broken, uh, really speaks to him of his all-sufficiency. All the fish, the net, the directions, it's all, all him. It wasn't about the fishermen here. It was about Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells them in verse 12, uh, come and eat. You know, there are three thoughts of the 153, and I'll throw these out. Um, various people had various thoughts on this. Uh, the number 153 might have been the, the number of different kinds of fish in the sea. Uh, it could speak of the variety of people who would come to know Christ in the future. You know, every tongue, kindred, people, and nation. Um, it's, it, it's, it could speak of a number of things. And I just leave it that there was 153 fish 
that was in that net, and the net wasn't broken. Now, the idea that the net wasn't broken, uh, obviously in times past, Peter must have experienced a broken net, uh, or he got caught on something, or it broke. Uh, and the scripture records here that the net was not torn. Can you imagine uh, verse 12 when you think about breakfast with Jesus? I think about these guys standing around this fire and they're, they're eating. Uh, and the Bible says none of the disciples ventured to question him. Must have been a quiet time. Um, they, didn't, they didn't question him. Um, they didn't say, who are you, Lord, knowing that it was the Lord. They knew who he was, but they weren't going to question him on every, anything. Um, here the resurrected Savior would have breakfast with his disciples. Uh, he manifested himself again to them, and they knew it was the Lord. And, uh, you know, as we, in our Christian life, uh, in our prayer times, um, that's why we have these prayer times, so that when we bring things before the Lord, we are acknowledging that we need him. He has to work through us. We, we cannot do the work alone. We, we cannot, we'd love to see our family members come to saving faith in Christ. We pray to that end. We, we speak with opportunity. But ultimately, uh, Jesus has to do the work of the conviction of the, the heart. In verse 13, uh, he uh, came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. What a scene. What a scene that must have been. If, if you were there and you were back, you would have seen Jesus again serving. He said, I didn't come to be served but to serve, even after the resurrection, he's serving his own. That's what he wants to do to you and I, to serve us. He wants to, he wants to have breakfast, so to speak, with us. He wants us to be fruitful in our service. He wants us, we aren't fishing for fish, we're fishing for people, for men, for souls. He wants us to be fruitful in our service, whatever that service is. But we can only do it under the direction of his word. And Peter and the disciples were going to learn that. Verse 14, he says, This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. They are serving now a risen Savior. The resurrection was before them. They, they had a powerful display of resurrection power. And as they were sent out with the Great Commission, they were now serving a risen Savior. They could say, we ate breakfast with him. We saw him. Thomas could say, I, I saw the, the wounds in his side and his hands and his feet. I touched it. Those were, were manifestations of the risen Savior. And they were going to be sent out on the Great Commission knowing that he had risen from the dead. So this fishing expedition was more than about catching fish. It was manifesting who Jesus is. They needed to see him. Then there's second thing. Jesus is knowledgeable of their needs, but he always meets the physical before the spiritual. They were hungry, and they needed food they needed something and then the Lord went to Peter you can look at verses 15 through 18 um, and he addressed Peter there was some things that Peter had to have addressed and um, the last fire was different than this one this one was going to be he's restored Peter was restored to the Lord uh, and he gave him a commission of uh, no more fishing. You're going to fish for souls. You're going to feed my sheep. You're going to tend my lambs. And he actually told Peter how he was going to die. He said, you know what? Someone's going to lead you where you don't want to go. 
And uh, only Peter would say, well, what about John? He was concerned about somebody. And Jesus said, don't worry about John, Peter. Worry about yourself. Worry about the commission that I've given you. But what are the takeaways? These men are now being equipped to walk by faith. Jesus was going to ascend to heaven, and he was going to be not there in person, but he was going to be there with the Holy Spirit. These men had known only walking by sight. Now they were going to be commissioned to walk by faith and carry on the, the, the building of the church. Can you imagine with the future of the church resting in the disciples early on? It's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing when you think about the various characters that made up the disciples. And now we have Peter and John, the disciples, uh, commissioned to carry on the work. So what can we, what can we learn about this, this passage? I think there's some things that we can look at this morning um, that we can take to heart. Um, the question is, again, how, did, how does Jesus manifest himself to you? He wants to be in a close relationship with you. He wants you to be in a relationship with him, unbroken fellowship. Um, he has great interest in you and me because he has purchased us with his blood. He has great interest because Peter is gone. But who's left? You and I. The ministry goes on through you and I. It started out with the disciples. They added to the church. But those people are gone, and the ministry continues on with you and I. But the same message for Peter applies to us. And it's following the word of God. It's following the word of God. Cast your nets on the right-hand side. Listen to what he's saying. You will never experience the full net in this life if we, if we relegate to our own ideas and principles. It is the word of God. Secondly, only the Lord's word changed an empty net to a full net. I can't emphasize that enough. We're moving away, our society has moved away from the word of God. And the consequences of a society that moves away from the word of God is exactly what you see. We, we justify all of our behaviors. We, 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 we are become our own gods and, we, and we, we, we decide. We make ourselves gods. And when we do that, a nation will be empty. They have nothing to offer. And so... Uh, this morning, the word of God must have preeminence in our life. Jesus is not dependent on our efforts. Jesus is not dependent on our efforts. Effort is good, but it must come under the, uh, the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do ministry alone. We cannot live this life apart from him and his word. I've learned that. I'm a slow learner, but I trust all of us this morning will, will, will know what it is to live a life that's fruitful. It's fruitful for him. And then finally, Jesus knows our needs. He provides food for his disciples. You know, he hasn't stopped caring for his own. He hasn't stopped caring for you. And there are days he knows exactly, he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knew Peter much better than Peter knew himself. Remember those words, Lord, I'll die with you. And what do we see, Peter? He, he, he's running away and he's warming himself by a fire and he's cussing and swearing and he never knew the Lord. Jesus knew Peter much better than Peter knew himself. And therefore, he could meet his needs. Therefore, he could meet his needs. And I think that's so important for us is that Jesus knows us personally better than we know ourselves and he has a way to work with us he doesn't give up on us he doesn't write us off as one who who who, who cannot uh, have a full net 
There's potential for every single one of us to have a life full of service. And that what a blessing that is. And he, needs our, he knows our needs and provides food for his disciples. There, we have needs. We, have, we all have needs. There can be discouragement. There can be challenges. There can be family challenges. Uh, there, there are many needs. There can be uh, a concern for our lost relatives. Pour out your heart to him. He knows it. But he wants to hear it from us. Do you have any food? No. Did you catch anything? No. Lord, I'm empty. It's okay to acknowledge the fact at some point we get empty and we're discouraged. But he hasn't changed. And he's there for us. So the little lesson this morning on fishing it was not really about fishing. It was about Peter. Getting him to a place, getting the disciples to a place where they would be see Jesus face to face and know who he is in a deeper way. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you wrote these words down for us. Often we can be a Peter. Let's just go and do and forget to inquire of your direction for us. Lord, there are times where we wonder and we question, we can become discouraged, and you know our needs and you provide for us in such a lovely way. We just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you didn't take Peter to the fire and say, why did you do this, why did you do that? No, you lovingly cared for him and you restored him back to yourself. We thank you that you are a loving Savior and a gracious Savior. Lord, help us, each one of us, to have nets full that our service would be complete. And in the eternity to come, uh, it would only reveal what our service uh, produced. Lord, we thank you and we love you. And we pray that as our time of fellowship draws near, that you just uh, bless us in our time of fellowship and our conversation together. And later on, as we remember you and your death, we give you our thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.